Well, hello everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar interview with E. Bennett Walsh, who's on the Gold Coast, uh, Yugen Bear lands. I'm currently sitting in Brisbane, Mianjin, um, on the lands of the Yagara and the Turrbal peoples. And I'd like to welcome you to this webinar from wherever you're coming from. As a number of you know, we're meant to be in person at the Gold Coast, but due to the uh, inclement weather that's around and some potentially dangerous roads, we've moved this to online. Um, thank you, Bennett, for joining us here today. Um, it's really wonderful to have you join us and share some of the insights from your filming of Mortal Kombat 2, most recently on the Gold Coast, which you've just wrapped. Um, but I think to kick off, and before we get into uh, interviewing you, I am going to share screen and show a trailer, which I think says so much about your background and the work that you've done. So, oh. Well, thank you um, for having me. Thank you for having me. And let's hit play. Start from the beginning. Sandy's dead. I know what I saw. You can't let him use the best of you. What makes you think that's the best of me? I suppose it's a little late for an apology. You suppose correctly. I want in. wanted to be the hero. You gotta pay the price. What was I supposed to do? Will it be on the cutting edge? This is it. You and I have unfinished business. There we go. Awesome. So wonderful. Um, so let's talk about action. Let's start there. What are the ingredients to producing and making a great action film? Like, you know, clearly that's your USP. So why are people picking up the phone and saying, Bennett, we need you? What do you what is it that you know that you bring to that to, to make a great action film? Well, I, I mean, that's a very broad question because it I think, you know, it's not, it's not like I started off to, to make action movies and, you know, I didn't even start off to um, be, be a producer, a line producer. I actually wanted to be a cinematographer and my very first job was loading lighting and grip trucks in Boston, Massachusetts when I was going to Emerson College. I mean, I think uh, I, I, I found my way into producing when I was working in an editorial firm in New York where I was, I was editing toy commercials and they got into the production business and we all just pitched in. Um, and, and I sort of fell in love with, with the production part of making films. Um, and, you know, I guess, I guess really, my break was Kill Bill because before that it was a it was a blend of suspense and 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 I did a lot of independent movies in New York that were all, all you know under ten million dollars and and when Kill Bill came along I had done some overseas experience and and they thought I would be able to tackle Asia um, I wasn't expecting. Kill Bill. Uh, it was we made it as one movie. Uh, Quentin Tarantino decided to split it into two. Only once we finished shooting, it was 155 days over nine months. Um, and you know, I think I just had you know the, the the people that were a part of that film. Wu Pang was the fight choreographer who did the Matrix in Sydney, and you know, it was just fantastic. 
because you know it was it was such an epic film and if that movie was you know was actually one film it would be his masterpiece because it was just so incredible um you know i understand why he split him too he just loved what he got and and he didn't want it to shorten it so it was four and a half hours if you combine the two um you know after that I made my first Australian film, which was Stealth in 2003. And that film probably cemented me into action adventure and predominantly also overseas. So to your question, why do they call me? They pretty much call me for the most difficult movies. <laughs> and and you know, sometimes it's in North America, you know, a lot of times it's overseas. I've made three films in China um and and they they give me the tough ones so what are the tough movies the action movies it's it's the complexities uh of all the moving parts and often multiple countries and i think to go to your second question is what makes for a great action movie and it's always challenging because you know technology advances action films advances and we're always trying to top each other so we're always competing to you know what the last cycle of action films were and the best action is when you can have character development and narrative storytelling during the action sequence you can go back 10 years you can go back 15 years and if you look at some great action movies you'll see how sometimes character development and, and narrative storytelling stops and we always try to infuse character development and, you know, story at the same time, because then there's something the audience can grip to enjoy the action, but also we're propelling the narrative and further developing it because, you know, a movie's two, two and a half hours and we're always struggling to get everything in because, you know, you go beyond that and, and, and it's hard to sustain, you know, releasing the film. So I think, I think, that's really what makes great action. And I was going to ask you about your break in the industry, which you just sort of encapsulated, but I suppose maybe you could talk a little bit about that um, first break into Kill Bill. How did you go from all that work that you were doing on commercials and grips, trucks and lighting and interest in cinematography? What, how did you get that break onto Kill Bill? Well, I should probably start when I actually started when I was 20 is when I went into the business. I produced my first film at 35 in New York City, which was $850,000 called The Brother's Kiss. So before that, yes, I, I was a, an assistant editor. I was a production manager. And it was the 1990s in New York, which I've always called it sort of the golden age of independence, where it was the rise of Merrimax and other uh, uh, independent distributors. But in New York City at that time, there was probably 10 to 15, one to three million dollar movies being made per year. Sundance was rising. Wall Street was investing because they thought they could make it for a low price and then sell it for three times. And there was a community of us making these, these very low budget movies in this, this environment. Um, I went on to do Too Tired to Die, which was a million and a half. Um, and then really my first break was boiler room which was a new line movie i was budgeting it for i think three million dollars for a different studio and new line came in picked it up and said we're going to make it for seven and i thought i hit the jackpot going from three million to a seven million dollar budget it was still a challenge and then that was when i left new york and and went to toronto and made a couple movies which then brought me to la um, I, I guess once I got to LA, Quentin's producer, Lawrence Bender called and, and said, look, at it. I understand you have some Asian experience. You've worked in Japan. Quentin's writing his fourth film and I'm going to get it in a couple of weeks. And when we get it, we're going to have you read it. He's looking for a new line producer. We'll bring in you and a couple of the people you meet and see what happens. Great. So three months, four months later, Lawrence calls 
I'm prepping a movie. He's like, okay, just heard from Quentin. He's going to be done in a couple of weeks. You're going to come in, read it, interview, and then we'll see what happens. Six months go by. I make up enough with Jennifer Lawrence or Jennifer Lopez. And he calls again and is like, okay, the script is ready. You got to be here tomorrow. Read the script. And you're <laughs> going to meet Quentin. So I'm in Detroit. I come in. I'm staying at a friend's house and there was the package. I opened it up, 225 pages was the script. I read it. I then go into the office and, 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 and meet Quentin. And he's talking about the film. I'm asking questions. We probably talked 45 minutes. He leaves, Lawrence comes in and says, okay, get started. We had talked for so long, for whatever reason, nobody ever else came in and it was just became my job. And then I spent two years with him making the movie. Um, and it was an but, extraordinary experience. Yeah, look, it sounds like that adage, you know, luck is preparation meets opportunity. Um, so That's what I always say. That is what I always say is that, that there's three ingredients to, 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 to really excelling in any, any field. One is you have to be ready and great at what you do. Um, after that, you have to be persistent and keep putting yourself out there. Because if you do that, then you create luck and you have to have luck. But persistence and being ready for that moment, then that's really how you excel. Was there a third? Did you say, did I miss a third? You had your three ingredients? The third is luck. By, by oh, persistence, the luck. then, the luck. then, then yeah. luck. Yeah, okay. Because it's been, luck is being there at the right time, at the right yeah. moment, the right skill set for what they need. And then. But clearly you'd had your hands on all the tools before. You'd, you'd been editing, cinematography, grips. Like you'd had that background where. Yeah, but they don't, they, they don't know. I mean, they don't look. I mean, when, when we got started on Kill Bill, Quentin, and this is just an example of you're ready, but you're not ready for whatever you get thrown into. Because every time you go into a film, I'm always learning more. You have new challenges. And that's part of what's making movies so great is that you're constantly learning and constantly faced with new challenges. He comes to me and says, I know I can do House of Blue Leaves, which is volume one, in a stage in LA, but I want to go to Asia and shoot it with an Asian crew because I want that type of skill set to bleed into the film and make it feel like a real Asian martial arts film. So I want to go over there. I want to go to Hong Kong, Tokyo, Beijing, and see what happens. I'm like, okay, let's go. And you know, we go to Hong Kong, we go to Tokyo, we go to Beijing, and he has a great time there. And that was in two, November 2001. We come out and it's like, okay, we're gonna do it in Beijing. And I'm like, okay, in Beijing at that time, you know, I didn't think we could be able to do it, but because it's Quentin, it was, okay, let's get started. We hire a Japanese production designer, does not speak English. And he has drawn, Quentin has drawn House of Blue Leaves on a tablecloth in a restaurant. And that's what we're basically building off of. I thought, okay, I'll go to Merrimax and they'll stop this. They'll understand it's too crazy to go to Beijing and do it. And when I called up my, my bosses there, they're like, you know what, after 9-11, China's probably the safest place. You go there and do it. And it was amazing because I think, partly because Quentin had so much respect, everybody that came on, and you know, he has such international recognition that everybody just followed him and it was extraordinary because I probably brought 15 people over from LA. The rest was predominantly a Chinese and, and a Japanese crew. Now, I had never been to China. I had, you know, my experience was in New York City, but I knew that I had to find a way to get it done. And that's probably the cornerstone of producing is that is creative problem solving. Is, is you're, you're faced with problems every day, but it's the creative problem solving that actually turns liabilities into assets. 
And I, I love that because I've often said, you know, there's the business of creativity is, is, is as creative sometimes as, you know, what ends up on the screen or there's all that decision-making behind, which, as you say, um, I'm just going to remind for people who are listening in or tuned in that we're, people are starting to put some questions in the chat and you can put some in. There are some questions coming in about MK2 and I'm going to get to that. Um, but just we're sort of getting there about your experiences in Australia and I think that'll be even all the more interesting because of this global experience that you you bring in to that and that gives you a particular perspective but I think um, why don't just starting to get into that, your your role now as executive producer, talk us through that. Um, I'm imagining people listening into this are going to be from the industry, some not. But, you know, I think it's always good to go back to basics and talk us through your EP role. As we all know, when we go to the movies, we see all those credits. And, and I know because I've seen you um, at work is... You're really the one running around doing a lot of that creative problem solving and we've had strikes and all sorts of things while you've been here. But, you know, talk us through your kind of um, the responsibilities you hold in the last sort of, you know, where, where you're at now in your career. What does that mean? What are you doing when you're executive producing a big scale Hollywood film? Talk us through, talk us through that. Well, what I can say from my very first movie in 1995 to Mortal Kombat, I've done the same thing, which has different titles, but it's, 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 you know, it's the formal thing is I'm a line producer and there's two producers. There's a creative producer, which is the one that will take two to five, 10 years to convince a studio, put them on money in and make it and as soon as they decide they want to make it they bring me on to 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 execute so a lot of times I say I'm the field producer the day-to-day -day producer but I'm taking the the script and and putting a budget and a production plan then the director and I go out and hand in hand we we go out and ex execute the film so I am the one that is first on the ground last out and and dealing with you know making sure that we're able to make the film that the studio has agreed on the amount of money. And since there are so many moving parts, you're, you're always over budget, or under budget at any given time. And depending on the size, those ratios are what you're dealing with, whether it's you're managing a half million dollar overage on a weekly basis or a $3 million you know, overage, because People, you don't really know until in a 120, 130 page script with X amount of sets and X amount of scenes, until you you really get the designs, get everything defined and a director walks on set, you don't know what all the final elements are. You're basically guessing and doing ranges. And as you are going through the process of prep, shoot and post, you're moving the money around, hopefully in the right areas that both the director and the studio wants. So it is a, a balancing act because when then when you add the unforeseens, whether you go out during the day and get rained on or something happens to an actor, you then have to compensate for that. And what I can say is the studio expects you to solve that problem not to go to them and say, what do you want to do? I have to go to the, my boss with at least two plans whenever we have a problem so they can decide the right route. Yeah, great. Does that Turning up that yeah, no, I think it's 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 very good. And um, I'm also just through the, the questions we're getting, I think there are a lot of people who are, um, we'll get to that later, who want to understand how to break in, how to pitch, how to kind of, you know, <laughs> put their scripts or their projects to the attention of the right people. But let's stay up in the big world of Hollywood for the moment and talk us through that, um, you know, the decision-making of Hollywood and using Mortal Kombat, because um, you've made two of them in Australia, that decision about 
you know, because as you were described by someone to me today, a, a suitcase producer, i.e. You, you can be anywhere at any time and you'll go what's best for the project, I guess. But, you know, talk but, us but through that. that. But, but that, that, that's the interesting thing is that <laughs> when I got into this, I thought I was going to stay in New York, stay in L.A. and make movies there because that's what we did. You would, you would go and 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 make a Hollywood movie in Hollywood and then go off to location. It wasn't until around 2005 that Hollywood started to leave LA and they were basically chasing tax incentives. And, yeah. and it started on an international level with Canada and Australia and the UK. And then in a domestic in the States where, you know, Atlanta, and London are the two busiest places on the planet because of their rebates. And, and it didn't really start until 2005. Um, it became a suitcase producer because now that's what it is. And I spent it on average a year and a half on a film to two years. So I'm always on the field and there's now not a place on the earth you cannot drop me and I cannot build a production facility and execute a film. I mean, I think... I go back to when I came to Australia my very first time in 2003 on stealth. That, and I guess what I want to illustrate is that every film is unique. You just can't say, okay, make that film in New Zealand versus Australia. Uh, on stealth, that film was being made in Los Angeles and it had, you know, a different line producer on it. And the studio decided, you know, we should probably explore Australia because they, they were starting to promote their federal tax incentive. And the line producer was like, I'm not leaving home. Now, I had just come off Kill Bill. It was a $100 million film. I was, was going to be my first $100 million film. I was like, I'll go. And I came out with the head of finance from the studio to basically like, okay, can we do this here? And, and uh, we're in Sydney. We were in Brisbane, came to the GC. And one of the riskiest decisions I made, which then my boss at the time who was running Columbia said was the most, the best decision was to build the planes in Sydney. The original plan was to, to build the planes in LA because that's where the craftsmen were. That's who they knew. Ship the planes and then, and then assemble them here. After spending time in Sydney and understanding the boat culture, the boat technology that was inherent to the community in Sydney, I went to my boss and said, you know, we can make these planes in Sydney and, and you know, just save on the, the cost plus of doing it in a different place. And it was, a, they weren't sure at that time. 2003 was a very different production climate, but, uh, but we did, we shipped them back to San Diego and they were the only foreign planes that have ever been on a US aircraft carrier, ever. Well there, well, there you go. So let's talk about, so all those great um, skills and, you know, I guess Mortal Kombat, um, make, you know, in convincing executives. Well, Mortal Kombat, yeah, see, if we go to Mortal Kombat now, Mortal Kombat one, was 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 a property that was in development for 10 years so my partner the creative producer on the project todd gardner he was pushing this thing for 10 years to get made now it was a bit of a liability because because the ip on the prior films were made in the 90s it was not like it was a hard sell to do that i met the director probably let's see we started 19 i probably met him in 2016 2017 and and new line the studio was like okay let's try to get this off the ground we were going to do it in belfast we were going to do it in prague we looked at south africa they rewrote the script and they weren't necessarily dictating where it was going they just knew they couldn't spend that much money on a reboot on something new. And I was going off, I did a movie, come back, they gave me a new script. 
try a different production center. And it was my boss at New Line Cape Beta who, who explored the uh, producer's offset in Australia because our other creative producer, James Wong was Australian, uh, the director was Australian and there was inherent characters within that script that was Australian and, and we qualified for a producer's offset. Now, we thought we hit the jackpot once we got the producer's offset, but we didn't have the state. Queensland was booked out, New South Wales was booked out, and the studio went to South Australia and they were like, sure, we'll give you 10%. And that's where they put us before, without a feasibility study. And Adelaide was a challenging production environment because they're used to doing more contemporary, a lot less complicated, or just not action fantasy. And we grew out of the studios incredibly quickly because I had a first unit, second unit, that's in itself 300 people on the shooting crew. And we had to move into warehouses. And But the, the decision to come here was purely the fact that Mortal Kombat 1, they only wanted to spend so much and we couldn't find a place in the world. And it took many, many years to find the right place. So when Mortal Kombat 2 came around, they obviously, you know, they, they wrote a script that was more studio based. And it came out of the fact of what the first film satisfied and didn't satisfy. And they took that information. And, and we knew we wanted to try Queensland because Bill Drocho was such a strong uh, production base, not just for the shooting, but also for the manufacturing. And I think, you know, the, 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 the thing I always sort of bring a focus to is that on these types of movies, you have a shooting crew of 100, 150 people on first unit. You have a shooting crew of 100, 150 people on second unit. So it's like having two films. But then when you add the manufacturing component where you are making everything from boots to, to lamp fixtures to the, you know, to the food, that it just increases to 800 people and, and the craftsmanship is incredibly high. Um, out of both of the films, and, and it, the last time I had been in Australia was 2004, and then I came in 2019 on, on the first film, that the level of craftsmanship just really was incredible. Um, you know, to the point where I think, yeah, London has very high craftsmanship, Atlanta doesn't because the craftsmanship was in Los Angeles and when it moved from Los Angeles to Atlanta, the, the, that skill died out. But I would say after London, Australia has the second best craftsmanship in the world. That's great. I have to say I've had the privilege of um, popping in on set and I know it's going to take people uh, much longer to get to see see the film, but I was blown away by what I got to see, just the fan, like the, the weaponry, of course, and which is important to action. And I'm assuming also you're balancing fans and, you know, also, as you say, the genre, the um, action genre has grown in, in its, um, you know, that attention to detail, I think is, is just everything was incredible and beautiful and so happy to see so many local Queenslanders um, and maybe others Australians working on on that. Can you also talk to us about balancing, you know, the visual effects component? So that sort of choreography of fights and, you know, you've got this incredible set with all this detail, but you're also sort of planning for visual effects in the mix and, and you know, just as you say, all these things you're balancing in that. But I think it's really important. It's a big part of action and particularly fantasy action getting all those pieces, the craftsmanship, the narrative, keeping the emotional resonance and then visual story, visual effects in the mix as well. well. So scope, it's scope, what audience, what audiences want are, are scope as well. Mm. I think, I think, and that's what visual effects does, which is, you know, when, when you're finished shooting, you, you, whether it's a 3D creature or you're adding backgrounds, uh, I had a particular set called the Sky Temple, which the concept design was eight pagodas. Now, we only had space and budget to build two pagodas, but in the film, you'll be seeing eight most of the time. 
and and you know that's that's the success story of the incentive that Australia has is 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 yes we do come in and we spend a boatload of money in six months which is a large infusion that multiplies out into the community but what also has evolved is the visual effects companies that are here yeah. and 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 they're not just working on Australian films they're working consistently on Hollywood films that are not even shot here yeah and and so through that incentive it's it's it builds out sort of a a, a permanent infrastructure and I've told you this before where one of our creative partners is rising sun pictures out of adelaide but they just recently opened up 50 seats in brisbane so i made sure that we were going to go to capacity when we awarded the contract because the skill is there meaning the oversight in adelaide and it was just to to be able to 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 infuse a facility in brisbane it just needs to happen. Melbourne and Sydney have great vendors and we use them, but you run out of people. You run out of, because they, 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 if they could hire 300 people, they would. So to build a center in Brisbane, I mean, that it's smart and it, it's needed because you, you can't just expect that you can, you can use vendors just in a couple of cities. You just run out of people. So listen, there's a question here from JD, which I really like, which is what did you learn on shooting MK2 um, that happened that has changed how you will approach your next production? What was the new thing you learned? And they've said apart from the strikes, <laughs> but aside from the strikes, what what's a, something you, you've learned on this latest production that you, you've kind of gone, wow. I can't tell you it's a while because I have been through so much that after I did Great Wall in China with Matt Damon, I, there's not a problem I can't solve. So, so even though we had a labor strike that lasted four months, you know the thing the thing that that I will always do is I doubled up the fight choreography time from, from typically two months to four months. And that really in, in, we had 18 to 20 fights. And what that did was give the other departments time to catch up. So often in these types of movies, action movies, is that we'll get the first, the first act is fantastic. James Bond movies, if you look at James Bond movies, they spend all their money in the first act action sequence. It's the first thing up, you know, and then and then the third act does does not deliver like the first. And so the second act gets half the time, and then you're chasing the third. And the third is the one that always gets shortchanged in preparation time. So I think the thing that 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 I did on this one is I doubled up the time for the fight team, and that really paid off in the quality of the film. I mean, I just I think help that us understand is... that a bit more. Like, so by doubling up, it gave what um, you could test to the weaponry and the props and the what is well, that? It was, actually, it's mean? actually, it was actually just fight design. Meaning, oh, meaning just fight the, design, the choreography. But, you know, you know, we we spent a lot. You know, because because you know there was eighteen to twenty fights, there can be fight fatigue. You know when somebody watches the film so i like to make sure that we talk through the fights so there is there's 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 a rhythm as well as understanding the point of view and the narrative anchor of each of the fights so that there is a journey and it's tough because typically you'll get the script and and you know we'll explain the fight but you have to dig into the character dig into also what are the what what type of fighting are they going to do? The thing that's Mortal Kombat, the thing that's interesting about Mortal Kombat is that it's a hand-to-hand -hand fighting sequence. I mean, it's a movie that's hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which is 
is in one way very straightforward. John Wick is a hand to hand fighting where if you look at, at, at Mission Impossible, it's, it has hand to hand, but it's also situational action as well, given you put them in a train and that's the, that's, that's the added action piece with some hand to hand. Or if you take a Marvel film, it's a lot of flying and, and you know, power beams and things like that. Mortal Kombat is very grounded in hand to hand. So you can fall into fight fatigue very easily. So by designing and then act, you know, then you have the fight team acted out, you shoot it. Then, then the other departments can start adding, okay, we can use a weapon here. Okay, this is the costume, what the costume has to do here. In our very, in, in our first film, we didn't have that. So our costumes were falling apart midway through the shooting of, <laughs> of the action sequences. And then we're just chasing it and all that. Second time around, you know, we were obviously, you know, a little bit more savvy about it. Okay, that's good. You so you've learned the uh, how to avoid fight fatigue and 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 really make those fight sequences hold up. And um, I'm just going, you know, some of the questions here around um, getting in the beginner's job. There's a lot of that, and someone um, Zayn has asked, you know that. You said it before, persistence is key, but where's that point where cold calling, where does it become annoying and what is that pathway in for, for emerging producers? How do they sort of get their foot in the door? And, you know, what do you are take you saying, kindly are you referring, to? Are you referring, well, are you referring to the industry or a specific job? Because I think... Well, this is broad know, on the industry, but I guess people are talking about... Um, well, they're not. It's not necessarily being specific, but I want to say, like, is there a point where if you this is a, this is a real question? Like, do you get blacklisted if you annoy too much and co over contact people? I'm assuming that would be the case where because everyone's time is precious, your time is precious, right? But how do you get that balance right? You know, what are the places that you can get in and get your foot in the door? And it is a general well, question. Yeah, it's it's it. Well, yeah, it's. it's I think it's easier than when I broke in um, back in, you know, I mean, I, my first film I produced was 95, but I started 15 years before that. But I think, you know, we're coming out, you know, the level of production is high and, yeah. and, I think one of the things that is great about the production environment in Australia is you have a very healthy local industry as well as a Hollywood industry. So, so getting a job on a, on a low budget local film is much easier than a Marvel film that comes into Disney studios. Yeah. But by getting on that local film, you're going to be with people that are moving on to a larger Hollywood film because they do both. So, Really, my advice is take any film because yeah. it, because you don't know where that's going to lead you, and 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 you don't know who you're going to meet, and and I think that's the starting place. I mean, actors, new actors, after they get cast and they do the film, they're like, "Great, I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to really work on it." It's like, no, 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 no. You're getting jobs here in Australia. Stay here. Because we're coming here, we're not going to hire you in LA and fly you here. You should stay here, or you, you know, or go to London, or go to Atlanta, and that's where you want to be because that's where you're going to get the opportunities. You're going to go to and LA. You're going to get an agent. What is that agent going to do? You know, I mean, I think you 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 need to. It's just taking any building block, and then using that to go to the next step. Yeah. If that, yeah. It's not, it's not, I mean, they want to know, are you annoying? Sure, there's <laughs> probably a threshold of annoyingness, but do people get blacklisted? No. I, I think, I think, but it's, it's, am I going to hire craft service people? No, I don't even know the company that was on our film. You know, it's, 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 it's production managers and production coordinators. And those are the people that you meet on any level production throughout Australia. 
I suppose it's that element of trust too, because you are working with, um, you know, you're working with a number of the same people, right? That you worked with on Mortal Kombat one and two, you know. I'm working with people that have worked with me since Stealth in two thousand. Yeah, well, there you go. So that's your point, right? That you trust, like it's that you want that because it's a stressful environment. So you want the shorthand, you want it. And so those relationships that you build as a student or in having those low budget opportunities to, you know, build yeah. your craft. Well, I mean, here's, but here's solve what I would problems say. Here's, here's more dash I, than cash. Here's, here's what I would say about lower budget films. You're going to get more responsibility, and that's what you want. You want yeah. more. Filmmaking is an apprenticeship field, meaning yeah. the more you do it, the more comfortable you are you act in that environment when you're under pressure. Film school is important because you learn history, you learn theory, you learn how to, you learn how to tell a good shot, you know, to tell a story. But... Being in that production environment to, to, to feel at ease in that pressure is doing it again and again and again. Yeah. And that's why when I said to you after Great Wall, you know, there's not a problem that I can't solve. It's because, you know, very often early in my career, I would have a problem and I'd freeze. I was like, holy crap, what am I going to do? Now it's just like, if I don't come up with the answer in the first couple hours, I know I just got to sleep on it. And in the morning, something will come to me. Yeah. And that's that you've got the trust in that you've solved problems so many times before that there's always a solution. And, um, and that's but, why lower budget films, you know, they can't hire as many people. And that's where you get the opportunity. That's yeah. where you get the responsibility. So given your global perspective, and I think, you know, I do think from an Australian market perspective, there is pressure on the local industry and we need to keep, you know, making local films and keep that industry going. Um, but also there's great successes from Australians who are making increasingly more shows from Australia that are making it on the global stage. Um, most recently, Boy Swallows Universe, which is, you know, a very local story that's just been a breakout success on Netflix. Very local Queensland. It's a Brisbane story. Well, very local story. Queensland and, and even Brisbane, a very local Brisbane story, very specifically set in the 80s. But I think just from your perspectives, what is it you think that as Australians we need to keep doing or do more of? And, you know, what are those ingredients to have our stories be successful on a global stage that maybe um, you and it is you're going to say I'm going to make an I'm going to come and produce an Australian story here, not just a global story here. But what what are those those ingredients that you think we all need to be mindful of in being successful in that kind of global industry? As you know, what what's that sort of qualities that need to resonate? You know, that makes audiences not just well, local think, audiences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Uh, it's, 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 it's a little difficult because people will say, you know, storytelling is, is universal. Meaning if, 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 you know, so you have the, the, the narrative or, or what the story is. And I guess it's because, because, I mean, if you take, Boy Swallows Universe, I mean, there, there, it's getting some international attention. Now, you can say it's because of the platform, you know, it's Netflix and it lives and dies on clicks, but um, I think it, it's, you know, it's, it's quality storytelling. I mean, you, you know, if you take, if you take, if you, if you take, I mean, Boy Swallows is interesting because it's it's a it's a period film in the seventies, I believe, or eighties. Eighties, yeah. Eighties, eighties in Brisbane. So it's 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 also even not accessible as a time period. You know, the eighties is the sort of like what is the eighties? Was it just bad hair? And I think you know, <laughs> yeah, it's it's, and it gets it's getting you know recognition, and I think it's 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 in the storytelling. It's not, you know, adding pyrotechnics and visual effects onto 
something that is is inherently not. I mean, you know, Taika is a good example of 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 a filmmaker that is doing very very New Zealand type films. Yeah. yeah. And then doing Thor, you know. Um, so it's it's hard. I I think what's important is to 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 have the support and to keep making it. And and I think both on a state and a federal level, you guys have very healthy programs to support local stories. And that that's incredibly important because you don't know what some you know a film hits for no apparent reason. You don't know, you know, it can it can be a, a moderate su- success, but then it can be a hit. Nobody thought Barbie was going to be a one point yeah. four billion dollar film. I was working at the studio on Meg Two. They were afraid that thing was going to tank after the director screening. So they saw the entire film and they were terrified that it was going to tank. So you know, in in some regards, nobody knows really what's going to work. So yeah. it goes it goes back to as a filmmaker you need to be confident with your point of view your eye and 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 be bold enough to stand by it so so i mentioned film school it's it's is is whether you shoot it on your iphone or if you have an alexa lf is that telling a story visually you know is is so important and and knowing when you have a good shot that is that is a good shot and 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 having a strong point of view because i think the one thing that i've learned you know because i have no interest in directing it's an incredibly hard job i love what i do as 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 a producer but what i mean i love what i do because i love analyzing a director's creative process because a director every director has a different creative process and, and, and when you understand what yours is, then you get the support, you know how to ask for the support that's gonna make you more creative. So I like that analysis because all we want is a better film, which is better creativity. Um, and I think, you know, what I've been, out of the directors that I've worked with, what they appreciate is a point of view so you know half the time my ideas are bad but what they always want is my point of view they want an honest point of view and 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 having that is is being confident in yourself of knowing what's good and what's bad and that's you know that's that's going through film school or watching three thousand movies or writing a dozen scripts you know uh and it goes back to what I said. It's an apprenticeship field. It's an apprenticeship. I totally agree. And a chicken and egg thing. So are you normally hired by the director or are you bringing directors in? Oh, the, 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 the director and I are pretty much hired at the same time. I mean, sometimes, you know, you take somebody like Quentin, you know, he, he, he has the project, so I meet him. But very often when they get the script, the director and I come on at the same time. Okay, because I we have a number of questions here from people who are interested in that path to becoming a successful director or the most important questions to ask when you're being hired for a film as a director. And I'm wondering, um, I know you come from the producing perspective, but I think what, you, what I've heard from you just say it's that apprenticeship thing, just watch lots of films, read, write lots of, do lots of drafts, but that very authentic Point of view so you've got that really you know what is it that what advice would you give for people who are looking to get into directing and or you know maybe make adding what you've already film. given make, make short films make, make and write meaning your first script could be the worst script ever but do it and then go to your next make yeah. short films because when you construct a short film you go through that process of like oh why did I make that decision when I was shooting? You know, why didn't I get that side of it? You know, or, or, you know, when, uh, how often do you put together your film, whether it's a short film, one minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, you show it to people. It's like, you know, they didn't 
feel like they went on the journey. You know, it's, 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 it's an incredibly complicated feel because of all the elements we put together. I mean, everything is controlled. So, so. And know, it costs real money. <laughs> and it, it costs, costs real, real money. money. So, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you know, so you, you can point to directors. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I obviously harp on Quentin because, you know, I think he's brilliant. He's one of the most freest creative directors I've ever worked with. Meaning when he's on set, he is loose. He's a jazz player. Like <laughs> he is so comfortable. And the reason why, and I've prepped three films for Martin Scorsese. He's a basket case when he's going through the process. Quentin, um, Quentin directs during writing. So he writes around the topic for three years. So there's nothing he doesn't know because he's, 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 he, he, he's written through it so many times. And if you look at his films, the settings are a Quentin setting. He's affected everything. It's not a real setting. It's not a real place. It's, it always feels like, wow, it bends a little bit this way. And I, that's, you know, uh, I, so I'm sort of presenting an extreme position because he's so gifted and he's so relaxed at it. Yeah, I have to say, and that comes across in your reel, you're clearly great at working with these directors that um, create worlds. Um, you know, and Mortal Kombat's a world, you know, and Quentin creates, as you say, they're, they're very defined worlds that you're stepping into as well as all of that action. And, um, well, and that's, 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 that's the point of view. I, 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 the, the directors of, of uh, John Wick, you know, they were, they were uh, action directors first. And I worked with them a lot and they brought me in on the very first cut of John Wick on the Avid it just you know it was ragtag they had a hard time doing it and um and I watched it and and you know they had all their questions they were insecure all that but it had such a strong point of view and they held it it wasn't much of a story his dog got killed and he was mad you know but <laughs> It told it through a point of view and held it. Sure, there was tons of things to work, but it was a, it was like you know they had another six months of post, and it was it was and I said to them, you got this. It's sure there's stuff fixed, but just keep that point of view, and it, it's going to be a hit. Right. Well, look, we're kind of out of time, or almost out of time, and so. Um... I am just I checking told you the I question. could blab, right? I told yeah, you I could yeah, blab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's all good. And we got to, I think, <laughs> most of the um, questions. Someone wants to meet you at the Actors. Are you going to be there? <laughs> What's yeah, that? Yeah, the Screen Awards. Oh, I think you, when are you leaving? When are you on the road again? No, I think, I think, I think. You'll I, be at I the Actors? Go. Well, okay. I think I'll go to the 8th and the 10th. Yeah, Okay. Terrific. Well, you're going to be around, uh, Benna will be around at the actors, but I guess just as a final message, because, you know, we love to hear it, but talk to us about your experiences in filming in, in Queensland and the Gold Coast and, you know, like, I, I, and I'm just going to acknowledge that you've been very generous. We've had to do some tours and you've always made yourself available, but, you know, just give us that sort of, you know, what your experience has been here filming in Queensland as your final message. Uh -huh. Well, shooting in the Gold Coast is wonderful. I think um, it's it, because well, let me, it's 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 several things. A, the government makes it very transparent how you can get the support. I think the Gold Coast uh, with Village Roadshow has 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 a strong production base, um, and you know, but you also have the landscape, so. You know, we changed things in our script to, to take advantage of Mount Tambourine, or we went into sort of more of the rugged landscape. Um, it's, it's, you, can, you can put a studio anywhere, but 
it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to attract the crew to live there. So the quality of life and, and, and how Australia is as a country has sort of, you know, created this, this population of craftsmen and, and technicians that really love it here and love what they do. So you, you have great quality of, of crew here and to be able to come in and there's such certainty when you throw a drawing down and it needs to be built and then shot and lit. And I've been in countries where you put a drawing down and you don't know what you're gonna get at the end of the day, but here you get the highest quality of craftsmanship. So it's, it's, it's the certainty that you have when you come to, to Queensland as well as the Gulf Coast. I mean, I think the thing that I only wish of more is that capacity could be higher more stages and more crew because okay. um, there are, limits. there are limits and yeah, we're working um, on it. <laughs> but I think, you know, but I think it's, 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 that's the thing about Hollywood and local productions. They can coexist at the same time because sure, you might have a cameraman in both units, but there's, they, they somehow are able to coexist because they, there are the offset requirements are different, you know, when you have capacity issues. Um, but I have to say that, you know, if I could stay here the rest of my life and make movies in Australia and the Gold Coast and then see what happens in the growth of Queensland, I'd be very, very happy. Well, I think that's a fantastic way to finish. And um, thanks for everyone who tuned in and those who are going to watch it later time and um well, thank Bennett, you just, for having me it's really thank you it's really thank you again for bringing mortal Kombat 2 to queensland but also your generosity and just general good spirit and um i'm sure it's been an awesome experience for the crew working on mortal Kombat. and you've got months of uh post-production to do but so we'll look forward to seeing it eventually mortal Kombat 2 but thanks thanks to you all Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. See ya. Bye.